Hello, I'm Geraldine Perigui. Today I'm getting ready in this changing room because I've got a big event at Laval Virtual. I'm going to speak uh, at a conference called VR for Cause. Oh yeah, here is the place where I'm going to talk. This is huge. It's so nice. Okay, see you at the event now. Bye-bye. We're happy to welcome Jardine Perriguet from XR Pedagogy. Welcome, Jardine. Hello, thank you. <laughs> I don't know, can you hear me well? Hello, everyone. Are you all here and happy? <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Okay, please give me some nice smiley, some emojis to tell me <laughs> everything is fine for you and you are here. Yeah, nice. <laughs> thank you. All good. Okay, great. There we go. So, hello everyone. So I'm the CEO uh, and founder of XR Pedagogy. And my name is uh, Geraldine Perriguet. I graduated uh, with a university degree in virtual reality applied to psychology at the University of Paris Descartes. So uh, this little guy that you see here uh, is Goji, <laughs> the mascot of my company. And we believe that VR, AR and MR should be easy to use for teacher and uh, homeschooler. And um, our goal is to provide online courses for teachers and parents of homeschoolers to help them feel comfortable to use XR technologies. So we aim to master the specificity of the pedagogy in XR to encourage students to design projects in the real world thanks to what they experimented or learned in the virtual world. So, and today I'm speaking from my home and I'm living on a small French island in the Caribbean Sea called Guadeloupe uh, and it's uh, 6 a.m. right now. <laughs> um, and like many other islands, we are prone to floods, volcanic risk, earthquakes, tsunami, ground movement and hurricanes. And well, when I first moved uh, in Guadeloupe, I arrived at the beginning of the hurricane season. Uh, in June and my husband and I we thought we should look for information about hurricane preparedness but you know we were looking for a flat and uh, from uh, one Airbnb to another we put this task on side uh, aside sorry so uh, we ended up doing that task and we bought water supply food and everything but one day a video hit me in the face and it was uh, in September 2019 and Hurricane Dorian struck the Bahamas. And this video, I've, in this video, I've seen a mother on, uh, on Twitter, and she was in her floated bathroom, praying from the deep of her heart with her kid, asking God to save her. And Bahamas are like one hour flight for, uh, from Guadeloupe. So Dorian has just passed next to us a few days before, but we were protected by sand clouds that time. And this day, after watching that video, I've, under, I've understood uh, what is risk perception and how much I had underestimated hurricane risk myself. So one of our projects uh, with XR Pedagogy was to develop a VR-based training for hurricane preparedness. And we focused on teenagers from Guadeloupe and studied the denial of the hurricane risk. And today I'm going to speak about the use of VR to prepare young people for natural disaster. And I will take the example of our project and share what we learned so far working on hurricane preparedness in VR. In this project, we work on describing how can we use virtual reality to teach teenagers to prepare for hurricane. So it's a serious game and the player starts the game uh, in his or her house. So I don't know if you can see this uh, good slide, but uh, we can see the slide uh, in the slide the house. And when the player starts, he receives the Facebook notification mentioning it's a yellow alert for hurricane. So the player must complete multiple challenges, like find some water, find battery, before the hurricane arrives, in order to win. 
And we emphasize uh, the psychological aspect to help young people to overcome the denial of risk. And I also did this uh, Vera game as a final project for my degree. And I wanted really to thank the University of Descartes and Pascal Piolino Lab for their help. Uh, at, uh, they're doing a very good training if you're interested in uh, psychology applied to virtual reality, uh, get in touch with them. Okay, before designing our environment, we wanted to understand how young people are prepared for are prepared for hurricane today in Guadeloupe. So we're very lucky. We had the opportunity to interview one of our regional public safety manager, uh, Mrs. De Vriel. And among Guadeloupean teenagers, there is no compulsory preparation, as far as I know, unless uh, it has changed since this, since this summer. It's the academy that will decide to organize awareness exercises. So the preparation efforts are mainly based on four classic educational content methods, uh, which are the di distribution of leaflets, reminding the precaution to be followed in the event of a hurricane alert, uh, continuous publication of posts on social network on the official public prefecture Facebook page, videos on YouTube in French, both in French and uh, Guadeloupean Creole, an oral explanation proposed by the teaching staff during class hours. So all these approaches uh, have been established for a long time and are valued from an educational point of view, but it may lack few ingredients. The question I, I wonder is why not using VR? Why not? Why uh, VR could be a great opportunity for disaster preparedness? So. Uh, Virtual reality environments appear promising uh, in its ability to bridge the gaps for, of other commonly established training formats. So there are three areas where VR could be considered as an opportunity for disaster preparedness, which are learning, uh, what I say, what I would call dangerous situation, and what I would say investment. So if you've been to other events in Laval, you really uh, I have, to have uh, many explanations about uh, the potential of, for, of VR for learning. Uh, of course, motivation and engagement are particularly improved in a virtual environment, especially by integrating gamification. And VR would make it possible to segment and simplify learning to make it easier. Uh, it introduces an, an original flexibility and the possibility of presenting information to the learner in multiple uh, formats and, and point of view. And I would say immersion itself is a learning catalyst. Uh, also, mistakes can take a real pedagogical status. Uh, they are make, make it possible to observe uh, consequences and uh, by supporting several ways of explaining it. But most of all, uh, VR allows the introduction of the body in the learning process. Right. Regarding dangerous situation, VR is an extraordinary tool to place uh, someone in situation when the real situation does not allow it because it's too dangerous. For many years, this potential of VR has been used, for example, to, stimulate, uh, to simulate interventions on nuclear reactor, for instance. And the player is faced with critical or even extreme tasks that are safe for himself or for others. And that's a real potential of, of VR, especially when you speak about hurricane preparedness. Uh, VR will allow learners to gain some experience in the virtual with graduation of conditions, simulating rare scenarios. Uh, so as we get investments, I believe application based on VR can provide a coherent multi-region and synchronous multi-organization training. And it could help improve the multi-organization coordination. And I think then, I believe that the investment is reasonable now in both uh, time and resource required. And uh, this training is really a scalable alternative. So, I've told you uh, how much myself I underestimated the risk and how much my perception of risk was altered when I moved in Guadeloupe. So I've asked myself, how could we use VR to impact the risk perception? So you see uh, in this figure, the hazard to action chain proposed by Gisela Washinger and her team. 
So she's a, a great researcher and um, you see that people with high, high risk perception are more likely to understand, uh, to undertake preparedness measures and take personal action. So, however, this, the model is much more complex and there are multiple external variables that are more likely to interact. Uh, otherwise, it would be very simple to prepare people to take action. So, variables that can impact risk uh, perception are education, experience, direct or in indirect, trust and responsibility, economic ability. And Watchinger and her team show that experience and trust in authority seems to have the most substantial impact on risk perception and willingness to take action. So you should see the, the chain to action. And another researcher, Kevin Ronan, is a researcher from New Zealand. And Ronan investigated the risk perception and preparedness uh, in a sample of 440 area school children. Uh, using a risk perception and preparedness based survey. And what he shows that children with more unrealistic risk perception were found to demonstrate a decreased belief in their ability to cope with a future hazard and a reduced awareness of hazard related uh, protective behaviors compared to children with more realistic risk perception. So I think there is an emergency to work on children risk perception using VR. And we believe that VR training could impact risk perception both directly and indirectly, and also the whole chain of action leading children to take action. Okay. We therefore defined uh, two, two hypotheses. Our first hypothesis were uh, VR training to prepare young people for hurricanes could facilitate learning and memorization of key knowledges. And our second hypothesis was that VR training could impact risk perception and lessen denial of danger, which is the extreme uh, version of, of risk perception. And VR could be an opportunity to guide this teenager in facing their ambivalence toward their perception of the reality of the cyclonic risk. So a VR is a medium for exploration and experimentation and you have to know how to arouse the curiosity of the user and adapt the content to the media. And to build our environment, we develop a user-centric approach by putting the learner in the position of co-builder of the virtual environment. Uh, we work with teenagers from Guadeloupe as consultants, and we did brainstorming to imagine uh, what could be an exciting environment to prepare to hurricane. And we have very, very nice uh, brainstorming. They, they arrive with a lot of super, super cool idea and, and so on. But this brings me to another important challenge. When considering to use VR to prepare young people for natural disaster, uh, you have to consider the level of realism. So when using VR for disaster uh, preparedness, the question of realism must be specified and argued. Uh, realism of what in relation to which situation, object, and description of reference for which objectives. Indeed, uh, the crucial objectives concern the fidelity of the expected learning behaviors of the user and the achievement of the training objectives. So I think it's a balance we must find between a realism through design and what are actually the best clues that could be identified by our targeted user to perceive risk. So we use an uh, empathy map as a tool to map these clues according to teenagers who actually experimented on hurricanes. So you, you can see uh, this, this map, it's in, it's in French, but uh, an empathy map covers seven items to emphasize this user. It's a really common uh, tool. So we work with a teenager and we ask them to tell us when they were experimented on a hurricane, what do they remember they see, they hear, what do they did, etc. And what do they think the player should see, should hear, to have this, this clue, very, uh, old map to, for us to design uh, the environment. In Group, uh, there are five levels of alerts and 50 tasks. So we faced the problem, how can we design the different scenarios? So in Guadeloupe, the alert level depends uh, on, the, uh, on the proximity of the cyclone from Guadeloupe. The closer it gets, uh, the more the risk increase from uh, yellow to gray, 
as you can see. And uh, here uh, on the top are the leaflets distributed in Guadeloupe and uh, explaining the task to remember. So we wondered how to translate this task into our game. Who are we to decide how to prioritize this task compared to other tasks? Can we translate this task into our serious game? So a few tasks were similar and were reminded multiple times, uh, but some tasks were very specific, like uh, tidy the garden to ensure nothing could be projected into the window. So at this level of our development, we have not yet solved that problem and we need to work on that part, requesting uh, help uh, of experts in designing educational content and, and risk manager expert in hurricane risk. But this was to share with you some of the challenges if you want some of the challenges uh, if you want to to use VR for natural disaster. Okay. So here is the player overall progression, and in this, this figure, uh, I show that those players start and it's yellow alert. And I show two situations: what I call the reward system, and the second situ situation is the feedback system. So. In the reward system on the left, imagine the player complete all, completes all the challenge in the yellow alerts, finding water supply, food supply, battery, radio station, flashlights. Every time the player wins points. And meantime, automatically the level of alert is changing. For now, we thought about every five minutes for our VR version to ensure the player won't spend more than 20 minutes in the game. Okay, now the second situation, the feedback system. So here in the square, you see that the player hasn't completed all the challenges before the red alert turns violet and loses. So when the player loses, uh, the idea we're working on is to find balance between visualization of consequences, giving advice, advices and clues, and maybe showing a video of a real person interviewed who experienced, who experienced a hurricane in Guadeloupe. When thinking about uh, of visualization of consequences, we can imagine a lot of extreme, extreme details. And one of the important recommendations I could make, especially when using VR for natural disaster preparedness training, is to include ethics. A way of ensuring that the player can leave the experience anytime he wants or feel uncomfortable is to establish a code. So if the player closes his eyes or her eyes, and say stop, everything stop, and you are safe again with us. Because uh, VR can make a uh, experience very immersive, and, and we are working with teenager. Because I remember one day a company wanted to show me some virtual content, and they drilled uh, to work on psychology, uh, psychology aspect. I volunteered without thinking it could be risky. And that made me try a random experience, with, uh, which was to work on a acrophobia, altitude phobia, but I did have this phobia. And it was a horrible, stressful experience for me because I couldn't think that taking off my, uh, the HND would take me off the experience. I was trapped in my fear. So remember to ensure that you have established a way for your user to escape. Because quite often I see VR experience where it's not easy in terms of user experience to find the exit door. And I think it's, it's important to mention it. Uh, one other aspect uh, of our training I want to share is what I say I call the advantage of the neighbor. So we introduced uh, one character, the neighbor, for two main reasons. Uh, to encourage empathy, knowledge transfer, and decrease anxiety. So it's highlighted by uh, Laurie Pick in 2008, a sociologist, that children have considerable strengths that could serve as a significant resource for families, community, and organization. Basically, they can contribute through preparedness response and also recovery. And the idea with the neighbor is to stimul stimulate uh, this natural energy. We wanted the teenager to encourage the adult to take the same action, or at least the player should be able to explain what he has learned about hurricane preparedness for a certain alert. And by doing so, the neighbor could help the player for difficult tasks. And this adult representation can also decrease the anxiety of the youth it has been proven that some prevention campaigns addressed uh, to children generate anxiety 
because they place the responsibility on children to ensure their own protection. And if you want uh, these kids, uh, this kind of training for natural disaster preparedness to work, you need to involve the community and establish a link between adults and players. And I believe uh, this is not really the memorization of the tasks that are going to be literally uh, improved when using VR for hurricane preparedness, but the preparation of the psychological state of our children. And that's why we insist on a, on a link between uh, the player and the community uh, represented by the neighbor. So uh, here I want, to, I want to share that exposure to virtual reality is not enough. If, I hope you can see uh, the figure, but uh, the figure is not exactly our experimental design uh, that, that we follow, it's a simplified version. What I want to share is that exposure to VR content is not enough to teach something properly in VR. Learning is a complex process that cannot be reduced to mere exposure to virtual content. It's necessary to define the different components of the use of the serious game. So we've decided to build our use case, including a before, a during and an after phase. So before exposure, it's the opportunity to explain uh, to young people what they are about to experiment. VR can have psychological effects that last after leaving the virtual environment. So environment can influence one psychological state. So if you wish uh, also to measure impact on task memorization, the before phase is the occasion to ask a participant to take a survey. So we took it for uh, the so risk perception survey. But once it's, they clearly understand the purpose and the code to stop everything, and once you've collected consent forms, of course, your participants are ready for VR experience. So when the exposure to the VR-based training starts, it's important to help the user at the beginning confirm presence and check the player's uh, psychological state, because getting to know VR-based help can challenge some users. So I believe it's important at the beginning to really check with them how they feel, how they are. You have uh, what we call the wow effect, but uh, some player can, can feel also better if they feel like someone is here for them. And after exposure, you can take survey to measure effect on, of the environment, but most of all, keep some time to let them share their emotion and help them find words to describe the emotion they had. So I think the debrief is how we can train psychologically young people to natural disaster by helping them cope with their emotion, even if these emotions were virtually induced. After the VR exposure, it's also a good momentum to give them a leaflet so they will be able to share what they've learned uh, with their family. And ideally, we'd like to measure risk perception as skills and skills acquired, but we also thought about heart rate and dermal response to assess anxiety and physical uh, response to exposure of uh, the environment. Okay, <laughs> so to conclude, VR is a great opportunity to prepare young people for natural disaster. An application based on VR can provide coherent, multi-region and synchronous multi-organization training. It could offer the, to young people a higher level of realism and immersion compared to classroom instruction and online teaching materials. And above all, they can address the perception of risk or even denial of danger. Remember that uh, the more aware a child is of the real danger and risk, the more likely it is that adults will be educated through the child's sharings of knowledge at home, uh, as argued by Ronan, a uh, researcher in 2001. So I'll conclude to finish. Make sure you avoid natural disaster in reality, but learn everything to get ready and virtual reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I think I'm going to take a uh, question. Thank you. Yes, please. Do you have any questions? Yeah, there's a question already. Okay, great. From Tiffany Deligny. 
Okay. The chat. In your experience, have you included collective reactions like crowd movements? Um, so for now, I include a few characters uh, because the idea uh, was to test uh, in a simple environment uh, because there are lots of variables uh, that are going to influence uh, our study. And yes, we want a few characters to maybe run and to give clues to the player that the alert is increasing. So, but we don't want uh, to have too many characters uh, because I think the idea is really to focus on risk perception and it's already a, it's already a very uh, complex environment. So yes, we include some characters and that will uh, participate to make understand and give clues that the level of alert is changing. I don't know if I'm answering well the question. Okay, any other question? Say yes, thanks. I see from uh, Hatja, how do you let kids participate? I'm sorry, there is a lot of questions and I can't see. James, can you help me on that part? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, and so Hatja from there asks, how do you let kids participate who do not underestimate the risks, the risk but are afraid of it? Okay, so... How do they not underestimate? Well, the idea is actually to work exactly on their perception. Uh, for, in terms of participation, uh, we offer them the possibility to participate, but it's uh, really, uh, for the moment, uh, I haven't worked with the local institution to actually organize something in school and so on. But uh, right now, we ask them if they want to participate, and uh, the, the, but uh, we are, were about to start a big round when the COVID crisis uh, starts, so we all uh, pause that experiment for the moment. And uh, yes, they will take a risk perception survey before, and uh, that is uh, really well described in, in research. And we will assess uh, what is our level uh, of or risk perception level, what is their risk perception level before and after, after uh, playing with the game, how this risk perception changed. Thank you for your question. I found that really, uh, really interesting. Okay, James, is there no que other question? Yes, there's a question from Clotilde Dubernet. Have you ever thought of adding the olfactory dimension to your experience? Of course, uh, I would love it. I think uh, the more senses are involved, uh, the better uh, the immersion uh, would be. Um, I also think about uh, adding uh, winds uh, or stuff like that to make sure that uh, all your body is involved in the in the process. And uh, my my real question is like when it is too much. And I, as I mentioned, when uh, could I say that it's actually uh, too immersive? Because uh, when you experiment a hurricane in real life, it is violent. It is strong, and this is not. Uh, we don't want to to uh, induce fear. You know. We just want to uh, immerse them. So I, at the same time, I want to add uh, a lot of, um, uh, you know, senses involved. I want the return, uh, haptic maybe uh, return. I want the, all the senses, as much as senses could, should be involved. But at the same time, I don't want it to be too much because uh, I don't want to induce fear. I just want to make sure that actually their perception of, of risk is correctly established. Okay, so uh, I see that there are uh, still uh, other questions. 
uh, if you don't mind, we're about to start the panel. So if, you, if you're okay with that, you can come over after the panel and discuss directly with, with, uh, with Geraldine, or maybe Geraldine, you can answer directly yes. in the chat. Um, before switching to the panel, knowing that it's uh, almost the last conference uh, of the day, are you all okay if we take a big selfie all together with the speakers, yes. Fabian, of course, the host, and the audience? What Please raise your hands. What a great idea. Yeah. Of course, let's take a selfie. <laughs> yes, <laughs> what a great idea. <laughs> Thank you for waiting, Fabian. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we do this? Do we? Uh, okay, let's. I'm gonna try to change view. Please come, Phil. <laughs> hey, hey! So, Tristan is about to take the picture, and all of us. Huh? Come on, guys, in the audience, it's time to show us you're here. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. I shall be. Yeah. C'est uh, James, c'est toi qui a pris la photo? Uh, Tristan l'a pris. Tristan, tout Tristan, tout. Tristan, super. Picture. Oops, sorry. Pardon, Jardine. <laughs> it's okay. Martin, Martinique, de mon côté. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do that. Hey, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Everybody is dancing. <laughs> this is a nice way to start. <laughs> Let's go back to the panel, the final yeah. discussion. Panel. Bye bye.